This is Fanboy vs. Transformers with Chris, Rob Clay, Brickinator, and Matt. Okay, so this is the first episode of Fanboy vs. Transformers, the new comic book podcast. Um, I decided... When we first talked about doing a dedicated comic book podcast uh, some weeks ago, I decided one thing I wanted to try to do with this was to honor the memory of our very good friend J.D. Church, who we lost last year. He never got a chance to bring Fanboy Versus back like he always wanted to after he had to put it aside for a while. And since he's never going to get that chance, I wanted to do that in his memory, on his behalf in the only way I really can, because I don't follow comics in general, but I really love the Transformers comics. And this this just seemed like a great combination of elements. So, um, joining me for this first episode, I have Rob Clay, uh, Matt, or Melvar, and Twitter's Brickinator, Mark. How's it going? Hello, everyone. Hello. So, um... I decided we should start the podcast with the new crossover event happening, uh, Combiner Wars. This is uh, Combiner Wars opening salvo, Transformers number 39. Um, the way it's been described is Combiner Wars is going to be a five-part event, and this is going to be the sixth, sixth extra part, like the Legends figure on the Combiners. That's actually how uh, I think John Barber described the concept of this. Which, I kind of question the in- like, how much of that is actual intent, but, you know, I, I guess it's easier for them than calling it six parts, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure once this comes out in trade paperback form, it'll all be in one volume. Probably so. Yeah. So, uh, previously in the Transformers, we wasted a whole lot of time on Earth to set up the acquisition of the Enigma of Combination, an ancient relic needed to create stable, functional combiners. And finally, just as some interesting developments were happening with the Earth storyline, everything left that behind to launch the Combiner Wars. Oops. (laughs) (laughs) So, we open with a monologue about how Cybertron has weather, and it was practically Florida-like in its hideousness the night the Combiner Wars started. Uh, During the narrative, Scoop arrives with the shuttle he took from the Earth-based Decepticons and delivers the Enigma to Starscream. Elsewhere, Optimus is trying to have a nice stroll through the ghettos outside Metroplex, but everyone just wants to kill him instead, and probably wouldn't mind taking out Windblade as well, who's with Optimus tonight for unclear reasons. Swindle's watching from a distance. Uh, The potentially impending death of Optimus Prime makes for great viewing, and he's got a bucket of popcorn energon. Uh, But his relaxation is disturbed by the arrival of Chromia and Ironhide. Chromia encourages the Decepticons to clear the area at the point of a gun, and Windblade tries to settle the situation down before the violence can escalate any further. Uh, that situation over with, Optimus and Ironhide catch up. Optimus came back to Cybertron several issues ago to observe the anniversary of receiving the Matrix. And Windblade finally gets to explain why she was here. She came to deliver some information, and the group retreats somewhere less open. So as Swindle watches them leave, we find out he's the one narrating the story. A uh, motormaster and company surround Swindle, giving a chance for some exposition to the history shared by the Stunticons and Swindle. So years ago, Swindle redesigned all of them to combine, but the process wasn't very successful, and Motormaster is holding a bit of a grudge, as Motormaster does. Uh, so Swindle establishes the setting, with Cybertron civilization being established within and around Metroplex. Uh, so Metroplex, Optimus and his crew have arrived inside, and they've gone to the Space Bridge room, because the Space Bridge is now finally operational, and it's ready to begin establishing contact with the ancient colonies of Cybertron. Uh, Windblade knows her homeworld needs help badly, but Chromia tries to downplay it, seemingly afraid of Caminus being invaded. Windblade reveals that her, Chromia, Ironhide, and Wheeljack have come to something of an arrangement behind the scenes, to quietly work against Starscream, although Wheeljack denies going quite that far. Optimus cautions them, though. If Starscream's rule is legitimate, moving against him could hurt their efforts at rebuilding society. But if Starscream is himself acting against Cybertron, Optimus promises to personally take Starscream's head. He's worried that Starscream will use the resources being presented to him, the Superion under repair by Wheeljack, to give him a weapon, and access to the other worlds through which he might try to forge an empire. And they reveal this is why Optimus was brought into their group now. Optimus instructs them not to let anyone use the space bridge, as he and Windblade need to go and speak with Starscream directly. 
Starscream is considering his next body swap, looking over a range of possibilities and taking every chance to stick it to Scoop, who believes in the process he follows far more than he believes in Starscream. Optimus and Windblade arrive, and don't wait for Rattrap to show them in. Windblade reveals the space bridge is restored, and Starscream is pleased enough to pop a rivet. He begins planning for first contact, as soon as, Star as, soon as Wheeljack has Superion up and running. Optimus warns Starscream to remember those are people, people, can, people Optimus considers friends, and they aren't just to be treated as weapons. Starscream calmly reminds Optimus of Devastator, and the reasons the colonies might pose even greater threats than just one unstoppable monster like that. Uh, Windblade says Caminus only needs help, and that both worlds can help each other in return. But Starscream won't be dissuaded, and orders them both to leave, and tells Optimus to get his own business worked out before becoming involved in Starscream's. And this nearly causes Optimus to lose his temper entirely. Starscream baits him further by taunting him with his old title, now considered meaningless. Optimus backs down and remembers that reverence for a title caused a lot of problems before, and warns that an empire cannot be allowed to start when they contact the colonies. Windblade proposes that they should form a congress of all the colonies, and Optimus agrees, insisting Windblade be among the representatives. Because it's time for the people to rule Cybertron, not a military, not an autocracy. Prime and Windblade leave, and Starscream declares that they have a busy night ahead. So Starscream first visits Wheeljack, who is working at repairs to the aerial bots. He says he has something to help, and reveals the enigma to Wheeljack. Cut to the ghettos, and Swindle's rolling up on his home. Inside, Starscream's waiting for him. Now, Swindle monologues about having a past, a reputation, but that's all behind him, isn't it? Until Starscream offers him a chance to become very wealthy. So, in short order, Swindle turns up at the Suntacon's door. He comes bearing gifts, a way to get them all back together like the old days, but even better, as Swindle now carries the Enigma with them, with him. Um, then I lost my place. Uh, Optimus has a teleconference with Rodimus, Magnus, and Megatron, wanting them to come and observe first contact, but Rodimus doesn't want to interrupt the quest again. However, he says he will send some representatives along. Optimus wraps up his call, but Windblade senses something's wrong. There's a change in Metroplex's background frequency. She calls up the space bridge room and finds Chromia and Ironhide disabled. Someone's used the space bridge. Far away, we find Caminus, which Swindle explains orbits a star that has been reduced to a white dwarf. It'll keep the planet's orbit stable, but not much else. There's not enough light for solar power, and the planet's resources are waning. Swindle says the population is looking for a miracle to happen, and there in the twilight sky a blinding light forms, and from it emerges Minasaur, Swindle on his shoulder telling the combined Stenticons to rob them blind. So that's our opening salvo into the Combiner Wars. Um, this, the, uh, the story pacing seems a little bit front-heavy and then kind of thins out toward the end. What do you guys think about that? Hmm. <sighs> profound, guys, profound. <laughs> yeah, that's... I, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to figure out where to start with this because, you know, it, it reminds me very much of the opening of Dark Cybertron with the narrative and the pacing, and that was not my favorite thing. So... <laughs> Right. I, you know, words would be great. Um, <laughs> what's the thing, though? Man. Especially for, you know, an audio presentation like this. <laughs> yeah. Unless somebody had, like, a guitar they want to break out and fill, no. fill the gap with. Well, I think it gets a little bit more charm than a lot of Dark Cybertron, just because Swindle, his narration, I, I actually like quite a bit you know swindle's a great character he's a charming character he's a sleazy character and you know him sort of bookending it i think made it more interesting that would have been with just and last time on the transformers you know something like that it was a little more we got that bones. Too. that's true like okay so like swindle's background in idw he did create menasaur the first time so it makes sense for him to be involved in this somewhat I'm not sure using him as the narrative character necessarily makes objective sense. And his his involvement in recreating Menasaur with the Enigma maybe it like I feel like that could have been anybody in the area. It didn't necessarily have to be Swindle. And I like yeah, I agree. I like the structure of the narration, but for the most part 
there's not a lot of that that's specific to Swindle's delivery. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm, I am not going to complain about Swindle being in the comic, though. I'm really <laughs> yeah. not either. Like, you know, Swindle in general probably needs more exposure than he gets being the only Combaticon who's ever made an impact individually, but, um... Yeah, I don't. I I just don't feel like him specifically needed to be with this involvement at this point in the story. Yeah, definitely, because the Enigma kind of seems like kind of magical. Like, could like have Motormaster just used it on himself? Basically, like you know, it was uh, didn't really seem like Swindle was doing anything. But then again, we don't see that on screen or on panel. Whatever well, you want to say. Also, you know, logically, I I'm just kind of. Starscream, that's something Starscream could have done himself and you would think would have just because something that powerful doesn't strike me as something he'd want to hand over to somebody else. Mm-hmm. You know, he may need more than one combiner at one point, especially if once he gets this rolling, there are, you know, unspeakable horrors on the other side of one of these space bridges. He, you know, he may want to have that for later. This It could be like a political thing, though, because if he... You know, he is in charge of Cybertron, and he doesn't want to look like he an invading force. So if he has somebody else controlling Motormaster when they go and loot the planet, you know, that can, I guess, take a little heat off of him when he pushes forward to make more combiners to stop this kind of thing. Yeah. Starscream wants deniability. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I guess, strictly speaking... Nobody else knows he has the Enigma yet. Optimus doesn't know. Windblade doesn't know. But if Swindle arrives somewhere with a combiner and the Enigma potentially in tow, that can't necessarily be traced back to Starscream as much as anybody would just assume, you know, this is Starscream's fault. Yeah, I mean, the the only, the only people who know be, besides Starscream and Scoop right now and Swindle are all on Earth and... Wheeljack. You know, yeah, well, and Wheeljack, but otherwise, you know, the the Decepticons on Earth aren't really speaking to Starscream, and the only other person who probably has any kind of guess is Prowl, and his credibility is not going to be great right now. And Wheeljack right now seems a little bit conflicted on this. Yeah. And that kind of showed in issue, what, 33, 34, when Wheeljack came back online. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. he's, being, he's being pulled in two directions because he kind of got to like Starscream over the first year of Robots in Disguise. Like, he thinks Starscream probably has a valid chance at making something of this, even though he had thrown in with Bumblebee at the time. Um, and, you know, Wheeljack's quick dismissal of being part of the active conspiracy against Starscream kind of says, you know, he's not ready to completely throw away his connection there, especially since he's motivated to fix the aerial bots, and Starscream's giving him the access to do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think I think when it comes down to it, Wheeljack is going to be conflicted whether to expose Starscream's involvement or keep his mouth shut and see how this plays out. What? Which basically means there's nobody around at the moment who knows Starscream has this and is going to say so. so. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, like, it makes sense that Swindle... Ha- like, he would. it makes sense he would hand over the Enigma so Swindle could make this happen. I still... I agree, though, that it seems odd for Starscream to really trust anybody to have unfiltered access to this like that. But Starscream is probably counting on Swindle's interest in being paid more than Swindle's you know, self-motivation to try to get something going for himself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, we're already setting up for Starscream's new body swap, which the covers uh, for the end of this have already spoiled is happening. Because we need new toys. Well, because new new toys are coming, and the comic has to keep up with that. Yes. (laughs) I don't know, for someone with such an ego as Starscream, it almost works to a degree, you know? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure this is yeah. behavior that's been shown before, but maybe, you know, the new era makes it more of a possibility to just cosmetically upgrade instead of needing combat motivation for it. Well, what, was he, I forget, was he, 
he was already planning his new body before Dark Cybertron started, as I recall. Yeah. So, you know, I, I have a feeling now that he's in charge, we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to see a certain number of vanity-based body changes. And considering this is a character who is regularly, who's, you know, accessory-wise is regularly paired with a crown, it, it isn't entirely out of the character. <laughs> no, I would say not. It, just, like, I even with um, the first body swap to what he's wearing now, it felt a little out of place just considering, you know, life on Cybertron is hard because it's all wild. There's not a lot of infrastructure set up. That seems kind of, you know, wasteful, but Starscream being Starscream, obviously he's not going to be concerned with uh, fair allocation of the resources. Yeah. I would just think that, you know, the people would tend to be a little side-eyed at, oh, he's walking around in a new body today, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Which we, you know, we might start to see some more of that in the future, but, you know, right now he just keeps throwing the I'm the chosen one, I'm the chosen one, the Titan said so around everybody, so he's getting away with pretty much anything right now. Yeah. And that's one thing I'm glad with this. We're actually getting a chance to see Starscream in office again. You know, this, this title has had a really bad track record of setting up very interesting things and then going to do something else. Yeah. And taking mm-hmm. months or even years away from those interesting plot threads. And unfortunately, that's already happened last issue where they set up really interesting stuff and we're not going to see that for probably half a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least three months since, you know, the six-parter will be across two separate titles. Yeah, I'm just expecting that, you know, something else will start. Yeah, and then... yeah they'll, they'll start something else mm-hmm. immediately after. And... Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes I look at this and think, does John Barber have an attention span? Hmm. Well, for the first year, year and a half or so he did. But... Yeah, and then what happened? And, yeah, until, <laughs> then he had to squeeze Dark Cybertron in and... And a six-month holding pattern waiting for more to meet the eye to catch up. Yeah, yep. and and now he gets the Combiner Wars thrown at him because, for some reason, he has to promote the toys and more than meets the eye is left to do whatever they want. But aren't we glad for that half of it? Oh, oh, very, very much yeah. so. I am yeah. so glad for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they're just, you know, they're, you know, we're getting Protectobots, but they're just like, oh, they'll they'll just be there. They'll, they'll leave the, the, the Lost Light. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And probably come back later. Yeah. But don't you want Cyclonus to be a combiner? Isn't that what you're waiting for? My toy, yeah. Not my comic. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, I would be really interested to see how that aspect would be worked into the fiction. I don't really want to see the permanent change based on that, though. Yeah. True, true. Uh, I don't want to see the, the Prime be a combiner in this, either. I'm hoping that they don't go with that. Oh, they are. Oh, they, Damn it. they almost have to. Yeah. One of the later comic covers shows the Ultra Prime torso oh, design. Maybe yeah. it'll just be a one-off thing. Just <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. Again, though, it's like, you know, maybe they can do something interesting with it and subvert our expectations on, hey, Optimus Prime is a combiner now. That will solve every problem ever. <laughs> Because I think I think that's kind of what we're seeing would happen with any of these characters becoming a new combiner. It's just if they're prominent characters that are going to be around generally anyway, why not just combine all the time and solve everything with giant fists? Yeah, though to be <laughs> though to be fair, it, it in the years since Dark Cybertron, Force or No Force, Optimus Prime has not been particularly good at solving anything. <laughs> you know, you raise a good point. <laughs> And if it's you like, if you make him, keeps, go ahead. Yeah, he keeps leaving Prowl in charge. <laughs> yeah. Ah, we'll see when he becomes a combiner though, and Prowl is one of his arms that will you know keep Prowl close <laughs> at hand, and he can keep a better watch over him. <laughs> no, I was thinking though, if Optimus has this much trouble solving problems by himself, just imagine when he's five times more Optimus. Five times more. When he's ultra, he's five times more. He'll have five times more problems solving problems. Mm-hmm. And his mind is going to be mashed with Prowl and Ironhide at the same time. Sunstreaker's going to be in there too. That's not going to help. No. <laughs> That's so many problems in one place. My God. <laughs> well, at least with Mirage there, one of his limbs can turn invisible and pretend it's not involved. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, if, if it can bring Hunter back, I'd be okay with it, but that's not going to happen, is it? No, Hunter's dead. Yeah. Hunter is very dead. Some of them over there, and over there. <laughs> <laughs> twist the knife a little harder, please. Over there. <laughs> I think Bombshell twisted the knife a little bit. At least uh, he's dead. <laughs> for now. Nobody yeah. stays dead, except Hunter. Yeah. Hey, Bombshell's got a toy. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, I'm not so sure Scrapper's gonna stay dead. Yeah. Cause, cause that's got a toy coming out too. Yeah. And that's got a pretty prominent toy coming out. We got this whole event about combiners and. Well, we've even been spoiled by covers that show a uh, classic Devastator, not just Prowl Stator. Well, yeah, there's that too. Way to spoil the ending. Yeah, sorry, guys. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it, this issue is not paced the best, and there's not a whole lot of meat to the story. There's, there's like, threads to follow on from this. It, you know, it's getting a starting point, but as far as the issue by itself, I think the best thing is we're going to see Starscream being Starscream being in charge of Cybertron, which is something I've personally wanted some more exploration of for a while. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the interesting concepts that was set up and basically abandoned, and now we're starting to see more of the payoff of that. And like now with Earth stuff potentially having some interest, I don't want to see that abandoned. But hopefully, after the event's over, maybe we can get more of a balance between what's going on at home and what's going on on Earth. If if all of these plot threads can be carried on. In the long term, I'll be pretty happy with that. Um, so I think I think the time has come, as much as we'd like to avoid it, or possibly not, because we might have stronger feelings on that. We should probably talk about the art. I'm all about avoiding that subject. <laughs> yeah, arg. So, you know, because this needs to be done ahead of time and not infringe on the other books' production schedules... Um, you know, we, we, we got Livio Remondelli doing the art for this, and um, this uh, it's it's certainly typically Livio Remondelli. Very much so. Yeah. Mark, how do you feel about that? Well, there's actually a few interesting things here. Like, I mean, Livio's not my favorite style. I thought it worked for gritty stuff like Dead Universe and even Autocracy, but... Uh, we've seen these dry, uh, these same, same places with other artists, and you know, Cybertron isn't like dead dead. It's it's more lively than this usually. That said, there's a few nice panels that I really liked. Uh, Swindle eating the Energon popcorn. I thought you know that's a great little expression on his face there. Uh, when Swindle meets Starscream and Starscream's there in the shadow, his foot kicked up. You know, he's looking all sinister. There's some nice poses like that but then you get other times like Windblade looks sad and two-dimensional all the time you know it's it's ups and downs with mostly downs <laughs> <laughs> that's a good description yeah well matt what stood out to you oh i'm i'm just not not a fan of this art style really at all Me everything's either. everything's too dark and colorless and and gritty and um, like like Mark said, you know, Cybertron's not supposed to be a dead planet right now. It's supposed to be chaotic, but not dead. And there's just there's no lighting to anything. It's it's kind of hard to tell who's who, you know, tell characters apart from time to time. And mm -hmm. oh, can I just say one thing on that? Telling about who's who, when uh, Menasaur shows up there on Caminus. And you can see Hotshot and I think Lightbright, who I would not recognize if not for the fact that there's a Sarah Stone drawn uh, issue previewed that showed those characters. I'm like, oh, okay, that's who they are. <laughs> I wouldn't have recognized them otherwise. I might have recognized Hotshot. I right. thought that was Hotshot. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you know, all of. Livio Ramondelli's weaknesses are well on display here. He, you know, I think he must be a real pro at meeting deadlines, which is why he gets so much work. Mm -hmm. But to do that, he makes a lot of sacrifices in line art quality, and he just uses, like, straight-up 
you know, filters in Photoshop in place of like actual source lighting. And the texture patterns he uses for worn metal on everyone got old several years ago. Just, you know, I, 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 I'm trying not to belabor this too much because, you know, I, I, I'm kind of reaching that critical reviewer burnout on Livy over Amandelli art. Yeah, I but, understand. But I will say that this is not the worst art I have seen from him this week. <laughs> he has one page in Angry Birds Transformers. Ah. And it has the sorriest looking RC you have ever seen in your life on it. Oh, uh, it, I mean, it, it is just, it, it is pitiful. Uh, if you get a chance, XV, check that out. Okay, well, that's something to look forward to or not. No, see, like, <laughs> you know, he he does good getting, like, unified color palettes to express the lighting and its effect on how the colors render. But, you know, I agree, like, actual sources of light... They don't really come through because there doesn't seem to be any real consideration for that. Um, it's basically just... If, it always feels to me like, you know, throw shadow on the part that's most dramatic looking with shadow on it. Mm -hmm. so even if it's on, you know, two opposite faces in the same panel. Yeah. The best, the best single panel that I have seen in this, the one that looks cleanest and best done, is actually the picture of Starscream at the bottom of the very first page. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'll agree, too, with uh, Starscream sitting on Swindle's couch. Yeah, there was that something was about nice. that I liked, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, though, we had that establishing shot of Metroplex, where for some reason he's wearing Galatron's cannons. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's kind of a... It's, it's a mixed bag. Yeah. It's a bag. <laughs> it's a bag of something. <laughs> Definitely. Um, okay, so I guess to round us out for this issue, why don't we talk about the covers? Uh, so, on... We've actually got, what, nine variants between the uh, regular ones and the uh, Superion protecting comic book store covers. Yeah. yeah. Protecting? Because it's really more like just pointing at... You no, know, he's he's putting his hand protectively over them, and that's that's totally it, right? Oh yeah, I think it's the still one a cool I, concept. I think the one variant that I like best is the Saint Mark's comics. Yeah, because I mean it's the, it has the most like visual variety since there's a couple of different buildings there. It's interesting because it's you know city apartment buildings, and the comic book store is a little uh, inset at the bottom. You know, on the first floor, so it's it's barely visible. There's just there's a lot more visual interest in that than in the other ones. Yeah. Uh, so as for the primary covers, um, so Livia Ramondelli did the subscription cover. I, I think we can probably you know kind of hand wave past that one. I, if I'm not mistaken, isn't that half of the uh, promo art for Combiner Wars that premiered as far back as like. Uh, San Diego, San Diego Comic Con. Possibly so. Yeah, I, think I can the picture other Minasaur. Is... Yeah, yeah. Um, so we can uh, go down to the uh, main cover and the retailer instead. So the main cover is a Casey Collar piece, and I love his art. Oh yeah. He, yeah. He's got the he's got the best structured line art. Just, I would love to see him doing interiors, but I think. Like, there is so much detail and effort put into the comic cover line art that he would never make a deadline. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Mm. But and the thing that really uh, sells this for me, too, is Joanna LaFuente doing the coloring. And I, ever since she took over on More Than Meets the Eye, I have developed a distinct appreciation for her coloring ability. She is really, really talented at this, and it shows through really well in this cover. Yeah, the sunlight coming in from the background, like of a sunset or sunrise or whatever, mm -hmm. that's that's really nice. The, the only possible problem with that is um, the uh, uh, tires on uh, Breakdown having a sunset-colored highlight, even though the sun is visibly behind Minasaur. Yeah. There's a mirror somewhere. 
Yeah, it could be reflecting off of something in front of them. <laughs> sure. Like, like Superion. I mean, a lot, maybe Superion's on the other side. A lot of him's white. It's probably reflecting off of that. <laughs> ah, you're right. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> okay, then the um, retailer incentive cover is by Sarah Petri Durocher. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I'm not exactly I, sure how to pronounce that, so my apologies if I have mangled that name. I haven't seen her work before, but this is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I like this cover the best. It, it's representative of the end of the book, but it's, you know, a lot more stylishly friendly than Remondelli's panel to the same effect. Yeah. And you can actually yeah. see, you know, everything in it and what the shapes actually are. Well, and look at all the character on Swindle. Yes, <laughs> Swindle looks vaguely uh, Transformers animated to me, and I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there definitely is some of that in there. Um, I think part of that sense is the uh, the smooth thighs, which was kind of a hallmark of the animated toy designs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I'm just like the the posing on this is really good. The facial expressions are great. Uh, I really like the coloring in this too. It's a different style that. It um, it's another case of like a uh, really good sense of lighting. Mm-hmm. Basically, the covers for this, apart from Livio's cover, really highlight the problem with Livio's art that we were talking about to some length. Because both of these have a fairly good sense of light sources and how the light plays across the figures, where Remondelli doesn't. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think this does even a little bit better than the main cover for that, too, because you get really convincing backlighting effects in how these colors are rendered out. Um, And there's just... it's um, One thing that I like about Sarah Stone's art is the the painted coloring style she uses. And Mm. this is sort of in that vein, but it's often a different direction that I really like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just hate how all the best covers end up being the retailer incentive. So, I mean, if I wanted to go get a physical print copy that has that, I can't. Yeah. I will be fine with the Casey Collier version. Oh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's definitely true. But, man, that is a great piece of art on the retailer incentive cover. It is. It, it truly mm-hmm. is. Uh, so, this was the opening salvo. Technically, part one of Combiner Wars starts with uh, The Return of Windblades, issue one, volume two. Um, that will actually, last we checked, be shipping next week. So, uh, that's when we'll be back to talk about the apparently proper start of Combiner Wars, and that should have some Sarah Stone art inside. So, uh, hooray! Hooray! <laughs> With any luck, we'll be a lot more positive on the art side of things next week. Yes. Uh, so, guys, do you have any uh, any final thoughts before we go this week? There were a couple of a couple of character moments that really stood out for me, uh, like when Optimus Prime sees Ironhide, and you know, oh, it's great to see you, but whenever he sees Wheeljack, it's like all business, and Wheeljack even later on <laughs> oh, in the issue is, is like mumbling to himself, <laughs> like, oh yeah, it's great to see you, you know, great to see you're okay and alive, and everything, Wheeljack. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, that was good, I'm yeah. kind of sad that I overlooked that when we were talking about it. Yeah, you know, the other thing, too, uh, now that you mentioned that, there's potentially a continuity problem. Um, so, you know, at the end of Chaos, before More Than Meets the Eye and Robots in Disguise started, the Matrix was supposed to be supposed to be expended in purifying Cybertron and resetting it, and the broken halves given to Rodimus and Bumblebee, but we see Optimus with his chest open and an intact Matrix inside. Uh, the Matrix housing was intact. I think the crystal was what was split in half, right? I've never been clear on that because the art doesn't ever show it clearly in any of the books. Yeah, I mean, it in, comes up in. in the death of Optimus Prime, he he had two spherical halves, which he handed one to Bumblebee and one to Rodimus. I was under the impression that that was the the interior of the Matrix, and the housing was actually unaffected. That's what Optimus is still carrying. That, okay. that makes sense because I, I seem to recall Perceptor uh, describing their half of the Matrix with the map as a type of geode, which would work for the crystal inside a lot more than the housing. So. Okay, I can live with that. It's still Hooray, kind of strange. 
I was just going to say, it's still kind of strange that Optimus just opens his chest in the middle of a conversation. Like, yes, this plot item is still inside me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, he Off had, he had to open his chest. He didn't have a trench coat. So, so how long do you figure until the Enigma of con, uh, Combination is going to end up inside that Matrix housing? You know, I'd be, I would think that more if the toys uh, chest, the detail inside looked more like the Enigma, or the Enigma in the art looked more like that. Well, it'll, uh, it'll change the housing until it looks like Energon Prime's uh, Matrix, which of course is what Ultra Prime's chest looks like. Yeah, I mean, I don't think this is an unlikely conclusion. <laughs> okay so i think that's going to do it for our uh, show this week uh thank you all for listening and we will be back next week with uh issue one of the return of windblade need to catch up visit tfradio.net slash amazon and start shopping for collected volumes of all the transformers titles for comic book news, reviews, and more, visit tformers.com. Fanboy vs. Transformers is a Radio Free Cybertron production.